Good evening and welcome to our History, Theology, and Philosophy meetup group. My name is John Hamer and I'm serving as the meetup coordinator. And by background, I'm a historian, a map maker, theologian, and I serve as pastor of the Community of Christ Toronto Center Place congregation. We always begin with our mission, which is to invite everyone into community, to continually learn and grow, to abolish poverty and end needless suffering, to promote peace and justice, and to live life meaningfully together. Um, we remind you that all of our content is listener supported, and we thank you so much for uh, your donations that make these lectures possible. Um, if you would like to support us, you can always go to our website, centerplace.ca, and there are places where you can uh, donate there, and your donations in the U.S. and Canada are tax deductible. So thank you once again. The series that we're doing right now, uh, this is the second in a three-part uh, series on the Book of Mormon, and so last week we kind of went in depth on the Book of Mormon's 19th century context and talked about how people who, when they would have first read the Book of Mormon, um, how they would have understood it given their understanding of uh, the history of the Americas. And next week we're going to talk about uh, the meaning and not only the meaning as of the authorial intent for the 1830s, but we're also going to talk about different kinds of readings of the book as a work uh, in the present day 21st century canon. So how can we understand it uh, now in a meaningful sense? But our lecture tonight is kind of a deep dive into uh, the authorship of the Book of Mormon, and I think this is going to be uh, quite a fun lecture, and so thanks for joining us. All right. Could begin when we're going to talk about text and authorship and all those kind of things. We have to talk a little bit about the um, academic discipline uh, called literary criticism. And so this is um, a discipline that focuses on text. It's uh, developed in modern times. Uh, uh, in great part, it was actually people were interested in studying the Bible, and that's one of the reasons why they started focusing on this. But there was other reasons, too, to focus on uh, text to look for let's say forgeries in contracts or, or charters and that kind of a thing. Um, and so after really centuries of close study um, of the Bible, which is really one of the first things that got studied and continues to be studied, this has actually led to a bunch of substantial insights uh, as scholars have looked at the component texts that make up the Bible. So just a couple examples. Um, we've talked about this in plenty of other lectures. Uh, but, for example, uh, in Isaiah, uh, one of the books in the Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament, um, one of the prophets, Isaiah, he was probably, there was a historical figure who was active in the 700s BC. And although he lived at that time, uh, the book of Isaiah, as we now have it, talks about figures and events that took place some two centuries later. Um, so, for example, uh, Isaiah mentions Cyrus the Great, the uh, emperor of Persia from the, who lived in the 500s. Um, that leads scholars to have identified essentially an anachronism. That's one of the easiest components of literary criticism when people are looking at how do we date texts. Um, and so what scholars have, have concluded with this text after close study is that in fact there is an early component that may have been edited a little but in general dates back to that early original Isaiah and then there were later continuations uh, a Deutero Isaiah, a Tertio Isaiah uh, which are written by later authors who really thought very highly of Isaiah uh, but are actually writing in Isaiah's name they're not Isaiah so in a way they are also pseudo Isaiah's um, another example of how does literary how does literary criticism some of the findings um, that we have. So, for example, um, in quotations, biblical quotations are in the four canonical gospels uh, attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, the historical Jesus um, would have taught in the contemporary language of the day in his province, which was Aramaic, Semitic language that's related to Hebrew but not Hebrew. Uh, nevertheless, the four canonical Gospels are all written in Greek. And so um, Jesus, as he's going around in the stories of these four Greek texts, 
frequently quotes from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, um, which would have been, he would have, the actual historical Jesus would have been speaking in Hebrew because a lot of people, even if they didn't know or weren't using Hebrew as their language, it's close enough to Aramaic that they might have gotten it or understood it from that way. Or, or maybe he was actually um, improvising at the time his own kind of Aramaic translation so the common people all around him would, would understand what he's meaning when he's, when he's quoting. Um, nevertheless, <laughs> Um, what we find when we look here in this kind of diagram here at Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and John, um, they aren't actually quoting differently as if each one of these uh, evangelists were sitting down next to Jesus, writing down what he was saying in Aramaic and then translating it themselves into Greek and then therefore coming up with their own translation. Instead, every single one of them went back to the already existing Greek translation of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint. And they just take that quotation out of the Septuagint and bring it into their gospel. And so as a result of that, that's showing um, in what literary criticism will say it call literary dependence. So each of those writers, we can tell, is writing after the Septuagint was translated, which is no, that's no surprise. They're all writing in the first century uh, of the common era AD. The Septuagint is in the first and second and third centuries BC, so it's older, and they're going back to that. And so another thing that that teaches us is that then um, uh, they aren't, uh, anyway, that they're quoting that. So that because they all follow the Septuagint, uh, in terms of the quotations anyway, the Gospels do not serve as an independent witness to Jesus saying these things. So if Jesus translated it in a particular way, that's lost because they are not copying that. They are instead going back uh, to the Septuagint for supplying those Old Testament quotations. Here's another example of uh, what literary criticism has taught us through kind of a deep study of the Bible. Um, scholars have long identified a, a literary relationship between the three uh, of the canonical gospels that are called synoptic, which means they can be read together because people have noticed for millennia that they're very, very similar. They're, they're in some cases, they're word for word the same. In other words, there's a literary dependence. They're not independent witnesses. It's impossible for somebody to have uh, been writing down something as an eyewitness and then translated it into exactly the same Greek words without consulting each other. So therefore, these authors have to be working either from each other's books. In other words, one of them has the, two of them have one in front of them or uh, all three of them might be relying on some common source that's been lost. Uh, there is a literary relationship is one of the things that literary criticism can tell us. And so the most likely scenario, as we've talked before, we've had a whole lecture on this topic. The most likely um, answer to the synoptic problem is the two source hypothesis, which is that both the authors of Matthew and the author of Luke both have in front of them the original Gospels, Mark and a lost gospel now, Q, that consists mostly of Jesus' sayings. And then independently, Matthew and Luke, those authors, are revising and combining those two earlier gospels. And that explains then this literary dependence among the synoptics. So one of the corollaries about that uh, is that a text like the Sermon on the Mount, which occurs in Matthew, that isn't an actual historical event when Jesus goes up on a mountain and gives that exact sermon. Uh, because Matthew is drawing upon and reordering various sayings of Jesus that he has found in this sayings gospel Q, that text is only composed in the 80s. So in other words, that can't uh, exist and you can't quote from that before Matthew would have all put it together in the 80s. So. Now that's kind of a little bit of a background so that we can talk about how we can apply uh, this discipline, academic, uh, this academic discipline of literary criticism to our study of the Book of Mormon. So the Book of Mormon, like the New Testament Gospels, quotes from the Bible, quotes from the Old Testament, like Isaiah, um, and it is thus literarily dependent on the Bible. Um, but what Bible? Which, which version of the Bible and when? So the Book of Mormon makes an internal claim 
that it's actually using an independent biblical source, um, uh, which it calls the brass plates, which is something that would have been written prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, and so before 586 and 587. Um, and so then as a result of that, it had would have that source. If that were the case, that, that claim, that all by itself is um, like that. If they, we had that text, a, a pre 586 uh, version of the of the Torah of the Old Testament, that would be f by far and away the most important uh, literary find in history. <laughs> so that would be pretty amazing if that claim were true. It also claims also and that it has um, an independent uh, an independent. Uh, uh, um, source or, or someone writing down uh, sermons that Jesus is giving uh, around 35. So in other words, independent of the four Gospels as they exist uh, in the New Testament and all the other actually um, uh, Gospels that exist that are not made it into the New Testament. So that would also be actually amazingly important if that's true. So um, I want to look at this and just look out, look at how the literary dependence works in order of getting to the Book of Mormon. So, um, as I mentioned, there's this idea of these brass plates, which would be recording some of the Old Testament stuff, specifically the stuff that's written prior to uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. And then, like I say, some uh, teachings of Jesus in around almost immediately, immediately after his crucifixion. Um, but what we end up finding actually is um, that there is actually, when we look at the Isaiah, for example, that exists in the Book of Mormon, not only does it have that early Isaiah that we talked about, it also has that, that later, those later additions to Isaiah, that Deutero Isaiah, which would have been written and added to after the destruction of Jerusalem. And likewise, um, when the Book of Mormon is quoting Jesus' teachings, it's quoting from Matthew's uh, version, which won't have been compiled into the 80s. So in other words, it's not an independent witness. And we can kind of see here again with those kind of those numbers uh, that if we look at these dates, it doesn't add up properly, right? And so the the brass plate source is too early for what we know later happens with the additions to Isaiah. Likewise, uh, the Jesus quotes, are, because they're from Matthew in the 80s, those also don't work. And so when we look at it actually, um, and it even more conclusively, uh, that the real source for those in the Book of Mormon is actually the King James Bible uh, that occurs at, in modern times, so 1611 is published. And so the Book of Mormon is very clearly then a modern text that's written in, in, in modern times, and it doesn't actually um, uh, contain either this very ancient version of the Torah, the brass plates, and there's also not an independent witness of the historical Jesus anyway. And so literary criticism then um, proves the Book of Mormon is a modern text. The Book of Mormon is broadly dependent on the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, the Book of Mormon quotes from the King James Bible and frequently actually idiosyncratically alters the King James text that is printed in italics. So plenty of studies have shown, you know, this is a direct uh, uh, literary dependence, you know, so the Book of Mormon pulls Isaiah into itself and makes changes, and the changes are almost always words that the King James Bible printed in italics, words that um, that people in in that time period felt uh, the King James were saying that those aren't exactly those are those are not the exact literal word for word thing, but it's what we have to do for the Hebrew in order to translate it into and transliterate it into English, we have to do that. And so the italics were seen dubiously by many, many readers uh, in that time frame. So the dependence, though, isn't just the quotation. So um, uh, I'm not even suggesting here that because the Septuagint uh, uh, is used in the Gospels, that that doesn't mean that there wasn't a historical Jesus who maybe walked around and quoted from the Hebrew Bible. But what we can say is that the Gospels are literarily dependent on the Septuagint. Um, the Book of Mormon's uh, dependence on the on the King James Bible, actually, it's actually true for the Gospels too, but anyway, is much more, um, is much broader. So, for example, in addition to quotation, uh, things like the sermons that Paul gives, the different letters that Paul gives, are reworked into sermons in the Book of Mormon. So the ancient figures that are, in theory, saying these, actually literary characters, are reworking 
um, uh, uh, writings of Paul from the first century. Uh, likewise, stories from Acts and Judges, uh, stories like in Acts of, of Paul and his missionary companions being uh, freed from prisons and things like that are also reworked, um, which just shows that the King James version of the Bible is the direct uh, source for uh, literarily not for the Book of Mormon, meaning that the Book of Mormon is conclusively a modern text. So. A lot of people, um, you know, maybe here will try to talk about why they believe or why they think that the Book of Mormon is an ancient source. And so because of this conclusive proof, um, they, they can use literary criticism to show that. And so what they need to show is, yes, the Book of Mormon is a modern text and it is literarily dependent on the King James Bible. If they want to show that there is also a hypothetical ancient source, they need to first be honest and admit that the text is a 19th century composition, and then they would use literary criticism to identify the seams. So you'd say these components that are in the text are from the King James Bible. These are clearly modern from a modern author. And then this component here, these sections um, are from this ancient source. Um, and this is done all the time. We can see that in literary criticism, uh, where we are identifying again, like the earlier underlying sources like Q that are embedded within uh, Matthew and Luke, right? Um, this has never been done as far as I'm aware. So nobody is doing this. And so nobody has actually has made the case at all for, for this yet. Um, it may happen at some time, but this has not been done yet. So the historicity of the Book of Mormon academically isn't in question. So it's a 19th century text. Given the fact that the Book of Mormon is a modern composition and that's not, like I say, in question academically, our goal tonight then is going to be to understand how it was written and um, by whom. And now that we've already done our proofs, I'm not, because the rest of the stuff is not proofs, it's explanations. So we know that this is a 19th century text and now I'm going to describe how did it come about? How do we understand it? So last week we talked about how uh, the Book of Mormon's 19th century context, how the Book of Mormon in fact narrates um, what we now call the mound builder myth, but essentially the history that all kind of 19th century Europeans and European American settlers believed about the ancient Americas. This um, myth that there had been because of the great earthworks, the mounds that were spread all across the North American continent, that there had been this high ancient agrarian civilization that was ultimately uh, killed. You know, we will say the Nephites, they, they wouldn't have that name, but anyway, in other words, they, an unnamed civilization that was ultimately killed off by uh, the, the ancestors of the actual the Native Americans. Uh, uh, in the Book of Mormon, this is called the Lamanites, so they didn't have that name, but everybody understood this to be the history. Um, this is not the history. Uh, it's not an actual, accu accurate history of, um, of the ancient Americas. In fact, we now know conclusively that the um, uh, indigenous peoples, the First Nations peoples of uh, the Americas built all the mounds. Uh, there was not some lost uh, alternate race that uh, was was exterminated or anything like that. Uh, but this was the belief that was widely held in the 19th century among settlers. So the Book of Mormon narrative, I'm just going to say, is not historical. The text narrates a common 19th century settler understanding of First Nations history, but it in no way relates actual history. So Native America has its own deep, rich, varied history. And we're not trying to, I'm not in this going to, in, in our exploration and our understanding of this text, I'm not undercutting or taking away from that. I'm acknowledging, frankly, uh, that deep, rich, varied history and identity that First Nations people actually have. So having then put that question of historicity aside, let's now look at what do we make of the Book of Mormon. So the reality is, is that much of scripture is entirely entirely literary in the sense that then it's not history so like adam and eve and noah and the flood the tower of babel which actually figures into the book of mormon narrative narrative abraham isaac sarah 
Moses and the Exodus, Joshua, the extermination of the Canaanites in the book of Joshua, uh, the book of Ruth, the book of Job, etc., etc. The characters in the book of Mormon are entirely entirely literary and they don't have historical basis. But that doesn't mean that they're like, that doesn't mean that again, the story of Moses isn't important and and meaningful and having religious value and likewise, uh, that we cannot find that or anything like that in the stories of Alma, Alma the Elder or Alma the Younger or the Stripling Warriors or anything else in the Book of Mormon's narrative. What it means is that we need to be looking for that meaning like we do often in scripture uh, as a religious text, not as a history book. Okay, so who composed this 19th century text and how did he do it? I'm going to assume it's a he. <laughs> So let's look a little bit about um, the equation or the problem that people sometimes pose with this. So the Book of Mormon is a 273,000 or so long word book. Um, Joseph Smith at the time of its composition was a 23 year old young man. Um, And in generally speaking, um, people, we wanna look at how long it took to do this and to see how complicated or how hard or impossible that might be. So a lot of times people set this equation up this way uh, in order to say um, Joseph Smith's young, um, in other words, it's a really super duper hard book to write. It's long and hard (laughs) that Joseph Smith had a very little education and writing capacity. And finally, that the composition process took an impossibly small amount of time. And so this is a uh, kind of the apologetic setup for um, the problem of the Book of Mormon as they see it. And so when they do this, they say, look, this just can't add up. You're never going to get this amazing, super, super, super hard to hard to write book with this more or less uneducated, illiterate guy and doing it in almost no time. And so what they want to do then is to say something else has really got to be needed to add up to this. And this is true for critics, actually, often and also apologists. So both times people kind of buy into this equation and they want to put something else there. So what else do they want to stick in to add it up? So one of the things is maybe there's an alternate author. So somebody who's much better at writing. Um, And so then that'll be thrown in there and then suddenly, okay, well now it's easier to do. You can fix the equation. Um, And so the usual uh, idea for this, especially in the 19th century, is that there was this guy named Solomon Spaulding who died in 1816, um, who was writing Uh, books about fiction books about the ancient Americans about the mound builder myth Um, and so maybe Joseph Smith got a hold of one of his manuscripts or his manuscript um, and that's where the Book of Mormon comes from I'm going to point out actually that we do have we did recover Solomon Spaulding's manuscript in the end and it's not very good (laughs) so there's not not the thing that the Book of Mormon is such a great literary thing but anyway the point of it is is it doesn't really add much and I would say to have Solomon Spaulding but um, part of the problem with the particular um, theory with Solomon Spaulding is that you need a whole kind of big conspiracy. So in addition to um, Joseph Smith just getting a hold of Solomon Spaulding's text, you also have to have um, probably uh, the scribes, at least Oliver Cowdery, who's Joseph Smith's main scribe in composing the Book of Mormon. Um, you also need to have presumably Sidney Rigdon, who is the person who is said to have known Spaulding and who have said to have purloined the manuscript, or not known him, but anyway, knew, known about the manuscript when it was sitting in a printer office and have purloined it. Um, then the person who put Smith and Rigdon together was Rigdon's associate, Parley P. Pratt. And then finally, well, is David Whitmer as one of the witnesses, was he also in on it? And so that's even a question. There's other possibilities. So you might start to have to have a big conspiracy in order to do that. Um, It's not that there's no such thing as conspiracies. It's just adding more and more in our Occam's razor to uh, what we have to believe to add up to get this thing to work. So it's not simply Joseph Smith finding a manuscript. So how else do people do it? So something else is needed. So for um, apologists who are literalistic believers in the Book of Mormon, um, uh, a lot of times they'll suggest, look, God can do anything. So the answer here is very clear. There's been a design, divine infer, intervention, and this equation is actually even a proof of a miracle. And so I want to give this, this is something that also people do. So people, um, 
uh, as an as a comparison people look at the pyramids in egypt and they say look these things are super duper hard to build <laughs> um they assume that egyptian engineers lack the expertise to build big stone objects they assume that egyptian workers lack the ability to move big stones and they will argue that aliens uh intervene since aliens can uh do anything Okay, so we're a little bit out of sync, so we're going to try to fix the uh, sync here. One second as I do this. What should it be? 400. 400? Yeah. Okay, we'll see if that resyncs up our uh, words. So the idea here is that. Um, you know, aliens can't come and they can do anything. And so that explains any time when, when we think that they can't do things. Um, I've actually given this before, on, I've given this slide before and on, um, uh, on YouTube, I think somebody commented that they agreed with everything that I said, except for this aliens part, because they absolutely believe that aliens built the pyramids. <laughs> and so anyway, this is a real concern for a lot of people that aliens built the pyramids. Okay. So these really though aren't the tools of academic history so alien intervention divine intervention or let's say a most more elaborate conspiracy theories it's possible that a conspiracy can happen but not anyway this isn't really the thing so if you want to prove alien intervention you don't actually it's not the it's not history that's what we need i'm going to suggest actually you need a physical scientist to show this so did the alien the aliens leave technology that it was impossible they could have had left an actual alloy that would be impossible for anybody to make today even they would they could have left some kind of a thing that a physical scientist could show look there's absolutely no way this is an alien artifact and it's buried you know at the level of the um in the foundation of the pyramid or something like that um it's not a historian who is this is not history when you're doing this um, there is no such physical <laughs> evidence for this and that but that's where you should be looking if you could prove um, alien intervention, you found a mummy with tissue that had completely different biology than Earth-based DNA. If you found some artifact embedded, embedded in the pyramid, whose technology is superior, right? Okay, so if you want to prove divine intervention similarly, um, it's not that you, you don't look to history to do that. History can't do that. This is a theological argument, and you can make you do this only by theology. If anybody is trying to do this, this kind of an argument, they're not, then it's not legitimate history. You can't do it. It's a theological argument. So we can do this. We, I'm a theologian too, and Community of Christ is a, a religious organization, and we have our own theological understanding of scripture. So the, in our understanding, according to the statement on scripture in Community of Christ, revelation is human response, written revelation, scripture is human response to the divine. So there can be divine inspiration, but the words um, are, are what humans then end up writing in their own time, place, culture, conditions when they're writing. So as we quote from the uh, scripture statement, scripture does not come apart from the humanity of the writers, but in and through that humanity. So in that sense, in Community of Christ, we understand theologically, our theological argument is when we say, thus saith the Lord in text, that's not literal and indeed scripture shouldn't be just read literally anyway um, so god is speaking through inspiration not through human words prophets in ancient times and today aren't just dictaphones that are repeating what god is saying as if he's talking just like uh, a human being would instead of uh, that which is beyond human comprehension and all words in scripture then as we have them are actually composed by human authors so you could have an alternate literalistic theology that's fine you may disagree and you might believe that prophets are dictaphones and that scripture should be read literally as words god spoke as if god were a human being um, and then if you do that there's going to be lots of different theological implications of your argument that you're making which is a theological argument and i'm going to say that one of those is going to be um, that that you're talking about um a kind of a God that is having all kinds of what I think are uh, capricious interventions in history and that those are going to ultimately get at kind of the, the major issue in theology, the problem of evil and 
if we were going to have a big theological argument about this, I think it, we would be able to kind of show, or at least I would argue strongly, that um, your God is then very implicated in all of the horrific suffering uh, of the world because your God is capriciously intervening and could stop that. But anyway, neither here nor there. <laughs> you can believe then in divine intervention. If your position is that God um, intervenes in the physical world in that particular kind of uh, over way, you're making an argument as a theologian rather than as a historian, and there's nothing wrong with doing theology, but I should argue that you shouldn't be masquerading your theology as if it were academic history. It's not history. That's not what history does. Okay, so keep theological arguments out of history. It's not a historical question at this point. Um, likewise, we don't use conspiracy theories anyway as magic. So to my knowledge, all the historians who have studied uh, this have concluded that there's really no merit to the idea that there is a conspiracy uh, with Smith, Rigdon, Cowdery, Pratt, Whitner, and so on and so forth um, that contrived to remake a Solomon Spalding text as the Book of Mormon. That's not, it's something that was a popular idea in the 19th century, and it still continues to be a pop idea, but no historians be, believe that. Um, because historians aren't doing that, uh, people have turned occasionally to computer scientists, and they have done things like word printing, which seems to give a kind of scientific legitimacy. The reality is that computers, when you program them, they can only return answers based on human created parameters. And you could type, you could feed all of the data into a computer and and the word print would come out that Shakespeare wrote the Book of Mormon, and that's based on programming. Um, that could happen because that's, anyway, what, you know, it's all based, it's not because the computers are always right, it's because it's based on human parameters. So history, you need a historical basis to proceed word printing. And so to find out, uh, you know, anyway, the historical authorship, you need a historian, you need to look at the disciplines, for example, of literary criticism. So history seeks most likely causes. So for example, if it's possible for humans to build pyramids or to write a book, then we don't need these kind of extreme explanations. That's not um, what history looks to. So indeed, history can't be used to prove alien intervention. So if you're taking this idea, you have this framed, you're looking at it and you say, look, pyramids are super duper hard to build the egyptian engineers can't build big objects they can't move big stones around and aliens therefore are necessary what that really means is that you have misframed your equation so actually you might find out that the pyramids must have been therefore simpler engineering from what you originally thought uh, it might be that the egyptian engineers had more know-how than you thought even if it's different than how we might do things today I guess I'm going to argue it turns out ancient people are pretty good at dragging rocks around because they do it all over the place, not just in Egypt, uh, Stonehenge and everywhere else. And aliens are totally unnecessary to solve this equation. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of other issues with aliens. But anyway, that's um, not not part of history. And that's going to be true here for the reframing of Book of Mormon authorship. So we have this equation that we set up. It actually turns out that composing this book is much less of a big deal than it's made out to be. It turns out that Joseph Smith is actually a much smarter guy and a much more knowledgeable guy than he's made out to be at this particular stage in his life. It turns out if we actually do the math, the time frame for composing this text is completely doable. And thus, we just don't need to have extreme explanations when we're looking at this from a historical standpoint. Okay. So let's look at each part of this equation so that we can just make it make the case for it. Um, writing the book. <laughs> so writing a book doesn't require a miracle. So Google says that about um, people have written about 130 million books. Composing a book is simply not an impossible hurdle. Um, I have had Muslim friends who've come to center place for our history, theology, philosophy lectures, and they've argued to me that it's impossible for Muhammad to have composed the Quran because because again, Muhammad was illiterate, and so then they create that same exact equation, right? Um, anyway, that's also, it's the same same results. In point of fact, I'm just gonna suggest the Book of Mormon is, is not miraculous or extraordinary in that sense. It doesn't display, for example, spe special knowledge of history or biblical literacy. 
Um, it actually includes none of the biblical characters from the time of Jerusalem's destruction. Uh, people like Lehi are running around and, and encountering people like Laban who are not mentioned at, at the time, even though there's all kinds of um, have known people, uh, like for example, the prophet uh, Jeremiah and his scribe and all these other, other people that are existing at that time. There's several books that are set in this time period and the characters don't aren't aware of that apparently. Um, it's not knowledgeable about Jewish practice, even as described in the Old Testament. So um, when, when Lehi and his family are running around in the wilderness, they are not um, following any of the Jewish laws that anybody who reads the Old Testament could have learned about. The text I, at the end of the day is far simpler than it appears. Um, there are, there's lots and lots of characters, but they tend, tend to be one dimensional. They tend to um, have story plots that are fairly wooden. Although there are lots of characters in lots of places, the author only ever has to have a few of these in their head at any given time as he's telling the individual stories. And even though there are sometimes very complicated systems like the whole uh, array of currency, um, those currencies don't come up again. So it's not like those are then used and used throughout the text consistently or anything like that. It's just one kind of laying out of a whole kind of a system and then it's uh, used and forgotten. Um, the text was and is kind of filled with errors. So the original text, if, we, if you have a copy or a facsimile of the 1830 edition, there's just thousands of grammar errors. Um, these are subsequently mostly corrected in Joseph Smith's lifetime. So in the second edition that was also published in the later 1830s in Kirtland, fixed thousands of these. Um, there were also though original several substantive errors. So at some point, uh, the text accidentally says Benjamin when it meant to say uh, Mosiah. Uh, in Benjamin had died at that point. Uh, and the entirety of it is just amazingly anachronistic. So it includes animals, crops, metals uh, that don't exist in ancient Americas. And it is t discussing almost entirely and exclusively doctrinally um, Christian topics that are of particular interest in the early 19th century, ideas in many cases and controversies that hadn't existed even a hundred years before the 19th century, and ideas that are of almost no relevance to us now. So it is very much talking in its own time, that 1830 context in terms of what it's even talking about. Um, so lots of people imagine that composing the text is a rather impressive feat. And so um, uh, even though that's, sometimes the case, um, apologists have largely conceded otherwise. So there is a Mormon, there was a Mormon um, major apologist leader of sort of a Mormon apologetics for the later, the middle and later um, 20th century a guy named Hugh Nibley. Um, and he created a thing called the Hugh Nibley challenge. Could you write the Book of Mormon? Um, but whenever he did that, in other words, you know, would you be able to do it? He then w proceeded to put his thumb on the scale. So he'd say, well, he, it would, it wouldn't count for John Hamer to take the Book of Mormon challenge because I'm too well read and too educated. Joseph Smith isn't that educated, right? And so you have to go through and do all these different things that you have to do in order to disqualify for anybody from being allowed to take the test. Um, it, it implicitly is explaining, what he's more impl less implicitly saying is, could John Hamer write, you know, in other words, could somebody who isn't, isn't having those limitations write it and he'd say, sure, you know? And so that's, again, it's, he's conceding it's not as big a deal as, as all that. Okay, well, let's look at Joseph Smith. How illiterate was he? So for many Mormons, um, when he later was 38 years old uh, in Nauvoo, uh, he's a theological genius who is articulating the plan of salvation, the meaning of life on earth in a way that is more clear than anybody in all of history, all the previous prophets, philosophers, uh, anyone else. Um, likewise, we often hear, for example, that the 15-year-old Joseph Smith talked directly to God and was able to perceive, for example, that all the world's religions were in error. So um, he's well regarded before and after, and yet somehow the same Joseph Smith at age 24 is always kind of imagined to be this illiterate guy who is unable to compose stories orally. So the actual fact is his background is neither especially educated nor uneducated. He could certainly read, he'd studied the Bible, he'd been tutored by his uh, 
older brother, Hiram, during a time period when he'd had this leg injury and was uh, in the house and, and held up. And Hiram had gone to uh, the uh, Academy for Poor Boys that's associated with Dartmouth and had actually studied lots of different things that actually end up being Mormon doctrine as part of the curriculum there at Dartmouth. So again, he's not as uh, dumb as he needs to be when he, in, in, in order for the apologist to make their case. It's also not ultimately an isolated projection. So Joseph Smith uh, displayed his capacity to compose text throughout his career. So um, he began, for example, dictating revelations that ultimately uh, became the Doctrine and Covenants uh, before the Book of Mormon was even finished. Uh, and so, in fact, actually, some of the Doctrine and Covenants uh, uh, verses are older than any of the, um, uh, the Book of Mormon as we now have it. Um, after the Book of Mormon is published, you know, those continue. Um, he also immediately began work on uh, the inspired version of the Bible, Joseph Smith Bible Revision or Joseph Smith Translation. Uh, he later composed the Book of Abraham. And uh, by the end of his life, he was actually dictating his own life's history, the Joseph Smith history. Um, and that was on an ongoing project at the time of his death. So there was um, uh, plenty of similar kinds of composition, you know, before, after, and during the Book of Mormon. Um, the Book of Mormon is itself filled with Joseph Smithisms. So it's clear that Joseph Smith wrote at least some of the text. So for example, the texts include Joseph Smith Sr.'s vision. So it's presented as Lehi's dream in uh, 1 Nephi chapter 8. Um, this is a, uh, a vision that um, uh, Lucy Smith, Joseph's mother, recounts as a major, one of the major visions that her husband had had. Um, the text of the Book of Mormon predicts that a choice seer who was going to be Joseph, the son of a Joseph, i.e. Joseph Jr. Um, it's, in other words, the text of the Book of Mormon is predicting Joseph Smith. And the text also predicts um, the Martin Harris and Charles Anthon story um, in 2 Nephi 27. And so specifically, um, we'll read a little bit of that. Uh, and it came to pass uh, that God, that the God, I'm sorry, and it came, and it shall come to pass that the Lord God shall bring forth unto you the works, the words of a book, and they shall be the words of them which have slumbered. And behold, the book shall be sealed, and in the book shall be a revelation from God from the beginning of the world to the ending thereof. But the book shall be delivered unto a man, and he shall deliver the words of the book, which are the words of those who have slumbered in the dust, and he shall deliver these words unto another. Uh, but the words which are sealed he shall not deliver, neither shall he deliver the book. For the book shall be sealed by the power of God, and the revelation which was sealed shall be kept in the book, until the own due time of the Lord, that they may come forth, for behold, they reveal all things from the foundation of the world until the end thereof. So this is text of the Book of Mormon that's talking about the idea that, you know, the book talking about itself, um, that the seer here, Joseph Smith, is going to deliver not the book, which is sealed, but words from the book to another, Martin Harris, and that Martin Harris is going to take it to another, i.e. Charles Anthon, uh, and then Anthon is ultimately going to say, I cannot read a sealed book. And so, again, all of this, um, that actual story, actually occurred before this component of the Book of Mormon was composed, right? And so this is a, a clear indication of the authorship here, the author here that Joseph Smith is at least writing this portion of it. Um, here's a, a prophecy that's self-fulfilled. And the day cometh that the words of the books uh, which were sealed shall be read from the housetops, wherefore, at that day, when the book shall be delivered unto the man of whom I have spoken, the book shall be hid from the eyes of the world, that the eyes of none shall behold it, save that three witnesses shall behold it by the power of God, besides him to whom the book shall be delivered, and they shall testify to the truth of the book and the things therein. So as they are getting to a time when they are going to um, invite witnesses to the Book of Mormon, um, then the text also predicts that. So there, the things in the Book of Mormon text are not some uh, alien conspiracy authors, uh, you know, who've been dead for decades, Solomon Spaulding writing. It's 
something that relates and tracks very closely to Joseph Smith and his, his own life as the, uh, at the time of the composition. So no alternative author is necessary, given that Joseph Smith continued to compose texts like the Book of Mormon throughout his career, and the fact that he clearly composed some of the texts, there's really no reason to imagine that he was merely editing a lost hypothetical manuscript from Solomon Spaulding, Purloin by Rigdon, and all these other conspirators. This simply in Occam's Razor adds nothing. So far, so good. Okay, so now we have uh, we have a Book of Mormon. It's a, a whole book, certainly. It's not completely impressive it's it's inter it's good but it isn't something that's impossible it doesn't require a miracle likewise we have a young man who goes on to dictate many similar works what about the composition time frame how much time would it take to compose so sometimes it's really argued that the bulk of the present text of the book of mormon was composed after oliver cowdery arrived in harmony around april 5th 1829 the book of mormon was then completed by the end of june that year leaving only about 85 days to compose most of the text which seems pretty rapid. Um, today, we primarily compose text using word processors working from written outlines. In the past, though, obviously they didn't have word processors, and paper was much rarer, and as was writing, and in fact, people memorized stuff much more, and they also composed their thoughts orally instead of using lists and, t and writing and things like that. In the past, oral composition was actually the norm, um, so, and that's, for example, the, how businessmen used to dictate letters so they would say to their secretary you know you know miss perkins come in here and i will dictate a letter to the uh, president of the american conglomerated uh corn whatever <laughs> in other words and he would just go through and list the whole thing off he doesn't have an outline he'd be pacing back and forth and and uh the person would be typing it up right that's because people would compose things orally it's just very different from how we think now and and, uh, and compose we now go in a word presses and we go back and fix it and all that kind of thing Anyway, in the very same way, 19th century preachers would just give hours and hours long sermons without notes. And, and again, much storytelling as, as the major source of information, sitting around the fire telling stories, that was all oral. And they didn't have, work from notes, they weren't going from an outline, they were just telling a long story and it could last again an hour. So, how does the math look for the time frame? So, in fact, actually, the limiting factor is how long how fast somebody can write so the scribe is really the limiting factor so the text is 270 some words long 270,000 some words long if you divide that by the 85 days that requires you to work um, compose a little over 3,000 words a day a speaker can dictate 7,000 9,000 words an hour so if somebody were to go back and transcribe everything that I'm gonna say over the course of this uh, hour I'm actually talking kind of fast. I would think that I'm going to be able to get through, you know, tonight, I might be able to get through three days worth of my Book of Mormon um, uh, composition. I mean, I am reading some of this because I have pre-prepared slides. Um, I, I'm using re reusing some slides. The total time frame, though, of making the slides was about, a, you know, less than a day. So I would have been able to do this in any event that way. In any event, though, legible handwriting is slower. So it takes about an hour for the scribe to write uh, 1200 words or so. So you can imagine it's gonna take more than just the one hour a day in order to, uh, to write it out. So if the pair then could po compose text at kind of top Oliver Cowdery writing speed, which is let's say about seven times slower than dictation speed, they would have to work around two hours and 40 minutes, three hours a day, right? So given that they were engaged in the project full time and they might have spent a full eight hour day composing text at a slower rate, um, this is completely doable seemingly. So, so while the time frame is relatively brisk, nobody's denying that this got written in, you know, not a, not a, it didn't take them forever to do it. It's, it's completely doable. It doesn't require a supernatural explanation. Uh, Joseph Speed is aided by the expertise, for example, that he'd already previously gained in dictating his first draft the last 116 pages um, that did not make it into the present Book of Mormon because of uh, those texts being lost and probably destroyed. Um, and he'd already been contemplating this project for some five years uh, by the time it was actually composed. Indeed, Joseph's mother, Lucy, later recalled, uh, quote, from the time, from this time forth, which is to say many years earlier, Joseph continued to receive instructions from time to time, and every evening we gathered elders.
chapter. In the course of our evening conversations, Joseph would give us some of the most amusing recitals which could have been, which could be imagined. So their family entertainment consisted of Joseph Smith orally composing stories about the ancient inhabitants, the Nephites, the Lamanites, the ancient inhabitants of the land, many years before he'd even gotten access to the plates. Um, she continues, he would describe all the ancient inhabitants of this continent, their dress, their manner of traveling, the animals which they rode, the cities that were built by them, the structure of their buildings with every particular of their mode of warfare, their religious worship, as particularly as though he had spent his life with them. The angel informed him at one time that he might make an effort to obtain the plates on the 22nd of the ensuing September. In other words, he already knows it all before he's got the plates, right? So. Uh, the historical consensus, therefore, is among academics, is that Joseph Smith is actually the source. He's the author, the com composer, anyway, of the Book of Mormon. I'm not saying author here in the sense that he's not writing it down, but he's author and an oral oral author. So, like I say, it's a whole book. It's not totally impressive. It's it's in in some I've made my complaints about it. Um, he's a young man who goes on to dictate many similar works. He's um, sometimes been described as a religious genius. Certainly he's charismatic, an amazing storyteller. Um, and of course, there's plenty of time for him to compose the text and we don't need aliens or conspiracies or anything else. So does that mean that the Book of Mormon is a fraud? So it's certainly possible to, cons uh, to assert now from history, uh, depending on your reading of Joseph Smith, that the Book of Mormon is composed as, you know, let's say, either a pious fraud, in other words, Joseph Smith knows that he's just making it up, but he has a pious reason for doing that, which is to say to bring uh, people to Christ, especially, for example, First Nations peoples, Native Americans, he wants them to be able to become Christians. Or you could also think it's an impious fraud, in other words, that he's doing this for notoriety or money or whatever you, whatever you wanna say. Um, I'm going to argue, though, that um, the Smith family also, though, practiced and believed in folk magic. And actually, um, uh, Joseph Smith's transition from being a treasure seer to being a religious seer was gradual and was taking place entirely over the course of this time period. And so I think it's also very, very possible that um, uh, he believed he was channeling uh, the actual sacred story of the natives. In other words, that it is uh, receiving what is a true story and his understanding anyway uh, and, and from the gift and power of God as he understood it so to do that I want to just look just briefly at the idea of folk magic so a significant part of folk culture so for people who are backwoods people like the Smiths uh, historically this has been belief and practice in folk magic this includes like folk medicine uh, divination adding removing curses this kind of thing uh, Joseph Smith Sr., for example, and Oliver Cowdery, others, they're known as using these rods, divining rods, um, for both divination and finding water is what you'd use them for, but finding any number of things. Lucy Smith, in her uh, memoirs, talks about drawing magic circles, and we know that the family, for example, had magic talismans. Is there... Um, thank you. <laughs> A lot of street noise. Joseph Smith Jr. and many of his neighbors, like Sally Chase, used things called peep stones or seer stones for scrying. So this is the same magic practice um, that is like looking into a crystal ball, looking into a, the back of a spoon or something like that. So looking into a seer stone um, is the same as like the practice of the queen in Snow White she uses when she looks in her mirror, magic mirror or mirror mirror on the wall. Um, Joseph Smith had been involved with money digging and in the money digging included guardian spirits. So uh, Joseph Sr., his dad and the money diggers believed that buried treasure was protected by magic and that there was a guardian spirit who was able to make the treasure quote slippery. And so as they would be digging close to it, the guardian spirit would actually cause its underground location to move. And so when the seer determined the exact location, it was necessary to perform particular magic rituals in order to fix the location and thus appease or thwart the guardian spirit. The same idea is actually in the Book of Mormon. So we know that this is part of the worldview here, right? And so in the Book of Mormon, uh, one, I'm sorry, in Mormon, which is one of the books inside the Book of Mormon, one nineteen to 20, quote, and these Gadianton robbers, 
who were among the Lamanites, did infest the land, insomuch as the inha- that the inhabitants thereof began to hide up their treasures in the earth, and they became slippery, because the Lord had cursed the land that they could not hold them or retain them again. And it came to pass that there were sorceries and witchcrafts and magics, and the power of the evil one was wrought upon the face all the face of the land, even unto the fulfilling of the words of Abinadi and also Samuel of the Lamanite. So um, this goes to Joseph Smith's belief that there was a lot of buried treasure in North America somewhere, if you could find it, but then also it was able to be slippery. In other words, through curses and magic and sorceries and witchcrafts, um, that's also involved here in this kind of magic worldview. The reality is that when you're a practitioner of folk magic, folk people, um, they do believe in the magic. So the practitioner, you know, the person holding the dowsing rod, the medium giving voice to the spirit, the seer looking into the peepstone, they may well know that there's more to the art than they let onto their audience. So the audience who's not the practitioner um, may well think it's much more literal. They may not think that their people are seeing with a spiritual eye that they're actually literally seeing it somehow or something like that. However, it doesn't mean, just because they know that um, there's more nuance, it doesn't mean that the uh, practitioner is necessarily a lying cynic. Some people are, uh, but practitioners actually, more often than not, actually believe in the magic, even knowing that some of what they're doing is simply tricks or dramatic for the purposes of uh, you know, the show of it. So I'm gonna argue, if the Smiths didn't believe in money digging, then why did they go money digging? <laughs> You know, so if they didn't believe in this in this kind of magic. So when Joseph Sr. is about to lose his farm in 1825, he takes his son on a money digging expedition, you know, which fails and it causes him to lose his farm. But he goes there because he that's what he really believes he's gonna get the money because he believes in this stuff. When Joseph Jr. then, even after he's president of the church, when the president is uh, is I'm sorry, when the church is in massive debt from building the Kirtland Temple and other other issues, uh, uh, in 1836, in order to try to resolve the issue, Joseph Smith leads a treasure hunt to Salem, Massachusetts. So a bunch of the other leaders of the church go with him and they try to find buried treasure within a house in, uh, that he believes is there in Massachusetts. It fails and leads him to lose everything in Ohio. He has to flee the creditors and everything like that. The whole church goes bankrupt and so on. But why would you bother to go on that hunt to Massachusetts, to Salem, if you didn't believe in the thing, right? So I think it kind of shows that he does believe in it. He might have also not believed in it. So, you know, if you've seen the movie, the Inside Out and other movies, you know, we have more than one voice inside us, right? And we can believe things and, and also have doubt internally. And there are interior voices within us that are saying different things. Um, I can also suggest that few people see themselves as villains. And so although people tend to see other people as conscious frauds, frauds with deliberate plots to consciously deceive. Few people actually see themselves that way. Some people do. There's, so I'm not suggesting that it never happens, and certainly it could be possible in this case. But people often, I think, justify deceptions as white lies that they are telling with good intentions. And even chronic liars often believe their own lies more than anyone else does. And we can see that's in the case of, of all kinds of well, there's, some, there's a fairly obvious uh, on the global stage uh, chronic liar right now. And I think he often believes his own lies, right? So here's a key text in my view for understanding Joseph Smith. Uh, this comes from First Nephi. And it came to pass that the spirit said unto me, slay him for the Lord hath delivered him into thy hands. Behold, the Lord slayeth the wicked to bring forth his righteous purpose as it is better that one man should perish that a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. This is the famous um, uh, moment when Nephi decides to kill Laban in order to get the brass plates, in order to prevent his people from not having scripture and you know, being in savagery. Uh, and so this is a, a classic ends justify the means, kill this guy and that'll, that'll cause a greater good. So I'm just gonna suggest if you can justify this, which is to say murder. This is an extreme uh, philosophical or theological case uh, thought experiment. Um, you could probably justify this, which is saying, telling people um, that this, your idea of a spiritual artifact that you've been challenging and channeling these, uh, these plates, which 
have only, if anything, a mystical experience, uh, mystical, mystical existence, uh, you might start telling people that who are demanding to see them that they're actually locked up inside this box and you fill the box up with sand or whatever you're doing in order to let them heft it. So in other words, ends justify the means. This part is a deception, a conscious deception, um, but maybe you're doing that for a good end, right? Um, so what's the source of that text? And uh, it comes actually this um, parish and unbelief thing. It comes actually from the Gospel of John. One of them named Caiaphas being the high priest that same year said unto them, ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people than that the whole nation perish not. So this Gospel of John's non-historical description of a conspiracy of the Sadducees and Pharisees to kill Jesus, although Joseph Smith quotes this biblical text as divine in origin, the evangelist here is actually showing that the high priest is immoral for uttering such a thing. And so it's a turning this um, idea on its end. And again, I want to say that this is not a historical thing. There was no such conspiracy. This is a problem in John. Okay. Um, so what I want to suggest here then is it's, uh, there's actually, even though we sometimes have this time period where we set, talk about Joseph Smith, money digger, and then Joseph Smith, uh, the prophet, that in fact, the two types of seer are, are, are not separate. Um, as a treasure seer, Joseph had already envisioned spirits that are guarding the treasure that the dumb money diggers seek. The spirit guarding the golden plates is envisioned in the same way, in a vision, not a visitation as it's always shown in artwork. Uh, the spirit guarding the plates requires a magic ritual to release them. And so Joseph Smith has to visit the plates on the equinox. He's got to bring a particular person. He's got to do X and Y and Z different things. In other words, magic kind of stuff to get the plates. Whether called a spirit or angel, as he later is called, whether he's called uh, Nephi or Moroni, as he's later called, the vision is like all the other spirits and angels envisioned by early members of the church and their contemporaries. In other words, it's something they see with their spiritual eyes. And when they, they as they say, they, their scales are taken off the eyes, the veil is lifted, and then they envision the spiritual realm and all the spiritual beings around them. So in so doing, early Mormon accounts are not unique. The historical record, frankly, is filled with these kind of accounts. So people um, encounter the spirit world and understand the spirit world in this way. Um, so the discipline of history, going back to our earlier, and we were talking about this right at the beginning, weighing the testimonies of primary and secondary witnesses in the light of their biases, they actually can't be used to prove theological claims such as physical visitations by extra mortal beings occurring. So even if we had unambiguous testimony of that, which we don't, that testimony is actually useless without external proof of the proposition that visitations can, can occur. Um, the reality is that the discipline of history can't be used to prove theology. We have testimonies of the visits of extra mortal beings to mortals across all cultures from the time of Jupiter visiting Io to Gabriel visiting Mohammed. Historians understand these to be either literary, mythic, visionary, or fraud. Um, so the reality is the same way Mormon historians, Latter-day Saint historians have the same non-supernatural explanation for all of these testimonies, save their own, you know, I'm saying apologists, even though their own are really not unique. So these are across all cultures. So um, although sophisticated people in the 21st century want to draw clear lines between folk magic and legitimate religion, in the Smith family, who were not sophisticated people, belief in the Bible, belief in Christianity, folk magic, spirit, angels, God, Christ, dousing, curses, magic circles, scrying, visions, sleeping and, wa uh, and waking uh, visions, they're all mixed up in the same thing. And that's all part of their uh, enchanted and also religious worldview. So we have tools for this and understanding this, in my view, in community of Christ. And so I've said it before, we understand scripture and revelation is a human response to the divine. Scripture does not come to us apart from the humanity of the writers, but in and through that humanity, scripture reflects the time, place, conditions, and culture when it's written. And in our next, uh, uh, week's lecture in part three. We're going to talk about how can we understand what is the now the meaning of this text? What was the authorial intent? What was how is it understood to its original 19th century audience? And what are some of the readings we might have for it today? 
uh, of use as it could be today in community of Christ and for anybody else religiously and not religiously. And that is my on Book of Mormon authorship. And so I'm going to invite uh, anybody who has questions and we'll talk to Leandro and try to get some of the questions sent to me. Um, hopefully, yeah, we took a little, that's a lot of slides, but I'm, I think I got through it. We'll have to clock how many words I got, but I think I, I at least said my, my number of words I need to compose the Book of Mormon in the course of the time frame tonight. Do we have questions, Leandro? You did. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Wow. Okay, now we got it. Now I've got it. I'm sorry that my phone was doing strange things. Um, so Leon asks, what do I think of Dan Vogel's opinion of Joseph Smith being a pious fraud? So that is a, um, a completely um, defensible take. So in other words, you can make the, well, it's not defensible to say that the Book of Mormon, you can't make the case that the Book of Mormon is an ancient document once you start now um, deciding what you, um, what you think the authorial intent is. Um, that ba is based on your reading of of uh, Joseph Smith based on, let's say, all of the amazing amount of um, witness affidavits that we have, um, and also everything we know about his character, everything we know about the text. I've got here on my shelf here, you know, five volumes of, of Dan Vogel's um, early Mormon documents. There's probably nobody, there's hardly, I mean, there's some people in the Joseph Smith papers maybe who are also as versed, but he's just gone through all of this stuff. And so, um, uh, it's a very uh, well-considered thesis that Dan Vogel has. And so um, yeah, I, I have no arguments. I mean, I have my own take, and, and but he has his own take, which is uh, completely defensible. Nathan Gale, I've heard um, some LDS scholars like Grant Hardy talk about uh, sophisticated literary forms. For example, he thinks that Alma 30 is a chiasm. What do I think of these kind of claims? So. So one of the big things that people um, have have highlighted when they've gone through kind of the literature of it is this idea of chiasmus, and so chiasmus is a um, is a literary form. It's a literary form that uh, exists in in poetry. In, in it's the word is chiasmus is Greek, so it's Greek poetry for sure, Latin poetry, uh, also Hebrew poetry, um, actually, but also English poetry. And so what I would suggest is that um, some of the things, in my view, that seem like chiasmus are part of the nature of oral composition. So this text is not being written, uh, uh, you know, composed in a word processor. It's being composed um, by an author who's telling the story uh, out loud and the scribe is writing it down. And so a lot of times what happens in an oral composition is that a person will circle back and so that ends up achieving this kind of thing of a chiasmus, which is that you say a thing, you say a thing, and then you come back to the first thing you said. Um, sometimes people have drawn these very elaborate chiasm, chiasmuses, um, and where they think it goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, G, F, E, D, C, B, A. Um, generally, um, these are, I would say, they're, I think these are the creation of the authors. I don't think these line up. They require you to delete things. They require you to ignore that certain things, like the C's don't really line up. They're actually different from each other. And so um, I think that those are the inventions uh, of, the, of the reader. Um, but anyway, I'm not trying to say that, the, that, the, that, there's, that this is not a that there's not good stories here or that it, there, there's no literary merit. Uh, it, there is, it's, it, and so uh, that's what I make of that. Uh, Nathan Gale, more off topic. Have you looked at the uh, uh, entheogenic hypothesis uh, to explain the visionary origins of Mor Mormonism? Basically, the hypothesis argues that Mormons are given psychedelics in, in, in sacraments. Um, I also, so, I have. I also, I would also say that generally speaking, this isn't 
necessary. I know that, again, we are living in this post-enchanted worldview time period. And so anytime anybody um, is talking about anything visionarily or having visions in our modern 21st century time, you just assume drugs have to be involved. Um, because, because we, on the one hand, um, we're so uh, imbued with these big flat screen TVs and, and, and the giant, uh, you know, being in these kind of experiences like this, that our imaginations are, uh, are you know, uh, drowned out by all of the media that we have. Um, it is completely possible to have um, uh, rich visions, especially in antiquity, without recourse to, um, you know, hallucinogens. It's completely possible that hallucinogens are used, but you don't have to, it's not a necessary thing. So if we have the, we, if we have the, uh, the sources that are explaining it and showing it, then that, that makes sense. If we don't, there's no reason for it. You can, you can uh, have a vision by by fasting for a day or anything like that. There's all kinds of different ways that you can you can close your eyes and envision without uh, without needing uh, hallucinogens. Um, C. S. Vance writes, everybody was having visions uh, at the time uh, with or without drugs. That's correct. <laughs> so so that doesn't mean that they don't have drugs. Like a lot of times. So for example, in the later 19th century, the amount of people that are on uh, on lanolin, so on on heroin-based, uh, you know, uh, opium-based drugs is actually pretty substantial. So I'm not saying that it's not possible because we don't, we shouldn't also use our any of our biases about these right now. But we need to look at what the sources say. And so I don't, I haven't read anywhere I'm uh, where it says yes, this is definitely the case or something. Uh, Bruce Nelson writes, um, F. M. Smith is the only. Um, Mormon leader I have heard of mentioned speaking favorably of psychedelics and so Bruce Nelson is correct so um, Frederick Madison Smith who is the third prophet of Community of Christ uh, had a PhD in sociology and he spent some time studying among uh, actual First Nations people and looking into um, uh, Native American spiritual practices including using you know hallucinogens which again i mean i'm not trying to discount the, the idea of using this um and so he wrote a book called higher powers of man which is the way that people can access visions and he actually spoke as um, bruce nelson says favorably with in on, on the idea of this would be a, a very valid spiritual practice and I'm, I'm not suggesting that it's not that's um it's it's simply we just i, I would also say it's just not necessary you can do it with and without um, <laughs> yeah, so we, we're little, people are very interested in this. So Leon also writes, the, uh, the leaders in the church in Kirtland drank a lot of sacramental wine during revelatory prayer meetings. We do have, um, we do have some, um, we do have some texts that say that. So we do have witnesses. My, um, my great, great, great grand uncle, Benjamin Winchester, um, testified that. So he even said that he thought he had seen Joseph Smith drunk on sacramental wine. So that, so there is some, there is, uh, uh, we, um, anyway, there's charges and counter charges that, that people maybe had some wine. Um, Diane, Diana Jones, you mentioned, uh, Nephi killing, uh, a Lamanite, actually Laban, Nephi killing, uh, Laban, who is a, a, a leader of Jerusalem and also a passage of John about it's better for one to die than a nation to perish. Uh, uh, and, and is that also the scripture used for blood atonement? And I don't think it is. So I am not as, um, so I am not as up on, especially, uh, you know, kind of Brigham Young, Utah theological practices and things like that. And how exactly he's justifying, uh, blood atonement. He's essentially blood atonement. The idea of that is not in this case i don't think laban is being killed because the idea of blood atonement was that um that christ's atonement is is limited and conditional and it doesn't at a certain point you can't he, it doesn't gonna work you can do something that's such a big sin that you have to shed your own blood in order to atone for it and so if you kill somebody or something like that or do something terrible then then and so then and so in that sense the 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 justification for blood atonement was uh, a capital punishment that included like shedding blood, like decapitation or hanging or something like that, or, you know, um, firing squad, they still have as a Utah death penalty, I guess, because of, um, uh, so the, uh, in order to atone for, um, 
in order so that you can blood atone for your a sin that you've committed and and again the person in the firing squad i guess is helping achieve that if that was the case so no i don't think it's quite the same thing i think it's a different um what i was trying to do is justify show that this is a a place where we can see that joseph smith's personal philosophy includes and justifies the means as opposed to blood atonement which is a, a different a theological idea that they have brigham young especially uh, Bruce Nelson, there are many examples in literature of authors um, with a vision of the future set at, such as Jules Verne or even Tennyson um, uh, in Locksley Hall predicting aircraft around 1860. So yeah, so you can be a secular prophet as well as a religious prophet. And um, in my view of prophecy is secularly or religiously is that um, that the future is is not written and that all oh, things are in front of us and so prophets warn of um, negative outcomes or positive outcomes depending on what people do if you don't correct your way so i could say um, if people don't take global warming seriously there's just going to be some very terrible suffering you know uh, in the future we're probably going to have it either way uh, in terms of the suffering uh, we're already having it in terms of uh, the number of the, they ran out of uh, letters for the number of hurricanes and now they're already on hurricane delta because it's just out of control how much how much uh, climate change is causing these super storms or california being on fire or australia um and so anyway i can predict that as a, a secular or religious prophet either way i think um and i'll probably be proved fairly right but then i've also predicted things where where i've been wrong because the future isn't isn't written and so in the case of a religious prophet uh jonah who is not a, a historical figure, but a literary prophet, um, predicted, you know, that unless the people of Nineveh repented, they'd be destroyed. Then they repented and they weren't destroyed. And that made Jonah really mad because he wanted to see them destroyed. <laughs> you know, so in other words, it's not a, th it's a, the future's not written. Um, Leon, lying for the Lord is a big discussion point among uh, some Mormon leaders throughout the decades that allegedly originated with Joseph jr to protect the kingdom yeah so i think again that's another example of um of this philosophy and it does date to joseph jr so joseph smith jr uh like you say lie for the lord in other words he's prepared to say uh things which are in some cases um where he's trying to say things that are technically true but in such a way as to deceive you know and so he will say people call me uh people say i have seven wives when i look around here i can't see but one <laughs> you know and so that isn't saying that i don't have seven wives it's saying i can only see one right in other words so so it's doing these kinds of uh of attempting to say something that is technically true as you're saying it but with the intent of deceiving somebody right and so he would do that and that continued to be um a practice in the utah lds church up until um, I mean, Gordon B. Hinckley quite famously did that in the, I think, the 90s, uh, where he said he didn't know anything about the central tenet of uh, Mormon on a, in an interview, in a secular interview, with uh, uh, he didn't know about each progression theology, and then he later went to general conferences and says he knows all about it. <laughs> so in other words, he was lying for the Lord, for the, uh, and, and everybody applauded him for being clever. Um, Roan Wagner, can you discuss the witnesses to the Book of Mormon? Yes, in fact, um, I anticipated that. I left. I did a couple um, additional slides, so just to talk about the witnesses for a second. So, um, what we know from when Joseph Smith uh, is talking about, although we make all, there's a lot of these artifacts like we see on the left, um, many people reported visions of the plates seen with their spiritual eyes. But in almost all cases, physical contact was limited to holding them locked in a box, or in some cases, feeling them under a uh, under a cloth or, or or something like that. Because Joseph Smith said very clearly to lots and lots of people we have that they're too sacred to be to be gazed upon, and indeed, if you look upon them with your physical eyes, um, you're going to die. And so, even as in the accounts that we have of the um, of the three witnesses which we have some pretty good accounts of that, especially uh, from David Whitmer and Martin Harris. This is a visionary experience where the angel shows them this. And, um, and Martin Harris was quite clear that that was an experience seen with the, f uh, with the spiritual eyes. Um, so for the, uh, 
for the eight witnesses, um, they had even less than a visionary experience. And I'll explain how it works. So um, you may be familiar with the characters transcript that we have in the Community of Christ archives. In this case, it says that Smith wrote out, it's not him who wrote this, it's um, one of the Whitmers who wrote this particular thing, copied this particular thing, he wrote characters. Anyway, Joseph Smith wrote out in the original of this characters that were said to be from the Golden Plates, a language that was later described in the Book of Mormon as Reformed Egyptian. So in the testimony of the eight witnesses, um, this is what this is how, how does it work so be it known to all nations kindreds tongues and people joseph smith wrote this statement they signed it unto whom this work shall come that joseph smith jr author and proprietor of this work has shown unto us the plates which hath been spoken so in other words he's shown us the box that has them into it he's shown unto us the place which has been spoken which has the appearance of gold uh, as it's been spoken and as many as the leaves as the said Smith had translated, we did handle with our hands. And so either they lifted it, it handed it, handled it with their hands, the, the, not, the non-sealed part in the box, or he got, they got to feel them under the cloth one way or the other. They're not clear here which one, but in other words, they're feeling them, they say. We saw the engravings thereon. You've seen them too. So now you've seen the engravings thereon, right? Because you saw the transcript. Uh, which have the appearance of ancient work and of curious workmanship. So to the maybe to you guys too, they, for they, certainly to the Whitmers here, they had the appearance of curious workmanship. Um, and we bear record to this with soberness. The Smith has shown them unto us, for we have seen and hefted. So they got to see them in the box. They got to hold them with the box. And we know of surety that Smith has got the plates which he spoken. And we gave our names unto the world to witness thereof. So this is, we just talked about lying for the Lord. So there's an intent here as Joseph Smith has written, um, has written this to um, make the statement seem like it's saying something that it isn't saying. There's in other words that you're seeing it outright. Um, that did not happen. Uh, and there's no testimony otherwise that uh, that anybody saw him outright. Um, this is, it's understood um, anyway, that they're seeing him in the box like this. Uh, what can you say about Joseph Smith not using the Book of Mormon during much of his com career compared to his use of the Bible, the Doctrine and Covenants, Revelations, etc.? So, um, so yeah, a lot of times people make, um, have made the case, um, friend of mine, Jan Ships, uh, I think was one of them, wrote, some serious articles on this way back when um, that the Book of Mormon then did not in, end up informing a lot of um, Joseph Smith's uh, um, theology. Um, and so why would that be? So I, I guess I would suggest is that um, it's not that they didn't talk about it, but they weren't as it didn't become as important to them um, theologically because in fact um, all of the ideas in the Book of Mormon um, don't track with Joseph Smith's later ideas. So this is his ideas as he is understanding them pretty much in 1829, not as he's understanding them especially by 1843, 1844. And so the content isn't really necessarily helpful to him. They are using it though, because they're using it both as a conversion tool and also to show that the heavens are, are still open. And so in that sense, it continues to be used for that same reason um, in the Mormon church, which it's not, uh, they also read it pretty seriously, but not, I don't think so much theologically. It's not teaching any of the things, it doesn't talk about temple rituals or internal marriage or anything that's important in the LDS church, except for the idea that um, it's some kind of an authoritative claim or proof that uh, the church is true. Um, Callie Hershey writes, um, pious or not, preaching to the indigenous people of a mythological version of their history sounds a lot like uh, psychological invalidation on a grand scale. What can modern settlers with a historically informed non-literal understanding of the Book of Mormon do to remedy that error? Absolutely. So um, that wasn't the intent, certainly. So our settler ancestors, Joseph Smith and my ancestors and everybody else who had a um, uh, earnest belief I think at least I mean, whether whatever Joseph Smith believed, certainly my ancestors had an earnest belief that uh, in the Book of Mormon as gospel and as a as a literal history and wanted to share that because of um, a promised advantage or good thing uh, in terms of help having uh, indigenous people be part of their biblical worldview in a in a positive way. 
Um, but to your point, it's exactly the case. It is actually um, psychological invalidation of uh, of all of indigenous culture and history on a on a grand scale. So, so in Canada we have ha a truth and reconciliation process where um, where we've where churches, where settlers, where natives, where we've discussed all of this um, history of uh, invalidation of of genocide of of not um, considering uh, the native cultures to be legitimate and of uh, doing everything frankly, to, uh, that settlers could do to stamp them out, to forbid the languages and everything like that. And so one of the things that we do uh, to try to um, make right and remedy is to acknowledge that, uh, to state that that's wrong, to apologize for it. Um, and so we're very, I want to always be very clear that um, not in any way suggesting that it's valid or um, licit to claim that this text has anything to do uh, with the actual true and valid and uh, traditions of the native people. Um, the reason why I don't think we should delete it and eliminate it is that there's the other, um, uh, the other pitfall that we tend to do is that um, we tend to delete these kinds of things from our history and then forget that we've done them. And so I think it's important um, that we remember that this was done, that we acknowledge it, that we uh, apologize also and not continue to fall into that error, uh, but we don't delete and forget it either. So so that's kind of my, my take on what we should be doing with it. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm not, are we seeing any more questions, Landro, or is that it? No. All right. Well, that was a wonderful um, question to end on. Thank you. And thank you all for participating in this lecture. As I say, next uh, week, we are going to, uh, in part three, look at the content of it and what, what it was the intent at the time. What's the authorial intent? How was it read by the people at the time? And how can we understand it now? So thank you so very much.